So we will be doing field work in a site where we will sample rock that is converted into soil for our geochemical work within the project Isonose. What we see here at this location is a site where rock is converted into soil. And what this means is that water flows through the fractures and transforms the primary minerals into secondary minerals. And then plants come and put their roots in here and consume the mineral nutrients released. And this process is called weathering. It's the conversion of rock into soil. And that's a massive geochemical transformation an enormous geochemical flux where many, many elements in big masses are cycled through the Earth's surface. Even though it's not like it's been fractured, it's already like... This one we will uh, crush and analyze uh, in the lab later. And so this is a very nice um, part of the weathering rinds. So this is the host rock. So we need to know the initial composition of all this weather material. So this is very important just to compare like what happened before and after the weathering process. So this I'm going to take to the lab and we're going to dissolve it and measure it by mass spectrometry, all the elemental composition before the weathering process. Marie, Rosesh and Josie are carefully taking geological samples. They sample the original rock and the products of weathering, the soil and sediment. Here we can see how the rock is transformed into soil along the cracks. The weathering process is taking place here, albeit very slowly. But how exactly does this work? Soil, the skin of the earth, is created where water meets rock. Rainwater seeps into the rock through cracks and chemical reactions slowly dissolve the rock. In the process, clay minerals are formed and organic carbon accumulates near the surface. The weathering process proceeds slowly, sometimes taking 10,000 years or more. It results in a characteristic layering, with a soil layer, shown in grey-brown, sitting above a weathered rock layer, shown in yellow. This is the great transformation that's constantly taking place at the Earth's surface. The final product, the soil that the scientists are studying, supports all the plants on Earth. But plants themselves are also major players in this system. In this rocky landscape, the trees grow directly on rock, which barely has any soil at all. How is this possible? The scientists want to investigate this process in more detail. According to a new hypothesis, plant roots or the fungi associated with them can decompose the rocks directly to get at the mineral nutrients found in them. Our researchers are geochemists. They work with isotopes. These track the geochemical transformations at the Earth's surface. When a rock dissolves during weathering, each element, for example magnesium, silicon or lithium, can follow different pathways. They can go into the newly formed soil, into the plants, or they can be transported away in dissolved form by rivers. Scientists must therefore sample all these materials for their isotopic investigations, as they're doing here with river water. When water is sampled, as much accompanying data as possible is recorded. For example, the pH, which tells us about the natural acidity of river water. So we have here a pH of 6.9. But what exactly are these isotopes that are at the center of this research? Atoms, the building blocks of all chemical elements, consist of three kinds of small particles. Electrons, in yellow, move around a nucleus consisting of protons in red and neutrons in blue. But the nucleus of an atom can have different numbers of neutrons. This particular chemical element can contain 8 or 10 neutrons, meaning there are two isotopes of this element.
If we now place the atom with 10 neutrons and the atom with 8 neutrons on a scale, we see a difference in the atomic weight, called the mass. The heavier isotope is shown in black and the lighter isotope in white. But both isotopes are the same chemical element. Our scientists use a new method, metal isotopes. What makes these isotopes so valuable for research is a process called isotope fractionation. What is isotope fractionation? The chemical elements that were dissolved in the water during weathering contain heavier and lighter isotopes. When a chemical reaction or transformation occurs, for example during the precipitation of a solid, the relative amounts of these isotopes change. If the solid grows rapidly, it preferentially incorporates the lighter isotopes. This is called the kinetic isotope effect. It's determined by the rate of precipitation of the solid. In the end, the liquid is left with more of the heavier isotopes, shown in black. At chemical equilibrium, atoms are constantly exchanging between liquid and solid, even though the solid is no longer growing. In this case, for example, more of the heavier isotopes in black end up in the solid, whereas more of the lighter isotopes in white end up back in the solution. In this case, the equilibrium isotopic effect arises. It's governed by chemical bonding strengths. If researchers measure the isotope composition of the minerals in rock, soil or river sediment and the surrounding water, they can see whether environmental changes have taken place quickly, the kinetic isotope effect, or whether they reflect a natural equilibrium in the Earth's surface over many, even thousands of years, the equilibrium isotope effect. Change of location. The GFZ German Center for Geosciences in Potsdam. Here the laboratory for the geochemistry of the Earth's surface is located. After the sample has been taken in the field, the real work begins, since the isotope abundances have to be measured. In this ultra-clean laboratory, everybody has to wear clean room suits and gloves to prevent contamination. The soil sample from the field has arrived in the laboratory. As the first step, Rosesh weighs the sample because we want to know how much of each element is in the soil. So we need to know the sample weight very precisely. The samples have acids added to them in Teflon containers and are placed on a hot plate. Through the action of the warm acid, the soil dissolves. The elements to be analyzed must be separated from all other elements. This is done in columns filled with fine yellow resin that can be made to trap and release elements at different times. This is called chromatography. Rosesh pipettes the newly dissolved sample onto the column. He then gradually adds acid, and the resin separates the elements from each other. They're caught in vials. The final purified samples are diluted and are now ready for measurement with a mass spectrometer. Directly adjacent to the chemical laboratory is the measurement room, full of highly sophisticated technology and electronics. At the heart of all this is the mass spectrometer. Rosesh now brings his purified samples from the clean laboratory into the measurement room. Hi. Hi. How is it? Fine. These are my samples from the field. Yeah. Can you Together with Josie, he plans the isotope yeah. measurements. This time, it's about the abundances of the isotopes lithium-7 and lithium-6. Josie places the vials into the automatic sampler of the mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer consists of an ion optic system 
an electromagnet and multiple detectors. At the front is a plasma torch that heats the samples to the same temperature as the surface of the sun. All atoms are ionized, which means they have an electric charge. We see the injection of ionized isotope particles into an electric field, in which they're accelerated to very high velocity. In the flight tube, they're separated by the electromagnet, which bends the beam of lighter isotopes to the right and the beam of the heavier isotopes to the left. Next, they arrive at the detection system. These detectors measure the abundance of the heavy and the light isotopes separately and transform them into an electrical current, which the scientists convert into an isotope ratio. The signal on the computer indicates the strength of the ionic currents and so the abundances of the two isotopes. But the work is still not over. The mass spectrometer generates large data tables. Rosesh and Marie look at these and discuss their results. So why is the delta value so high in this sample? Well, that is actually not a sample, it's, it's a standard. These values are averages mm -hmm. out of three. Mm -hmm. that, that's the intensity, it's, it's lithium-7, and then we have the different ratios. Mm -hmm. At Griebnitzsee in Potsdam, where the Berlin Wall once ran, the doctoral students and senior scientists of the European Isonose project meet for their annual workshop. Here they present and discuss their latest scientific results with their colleagues. In the 19th century, Darcy um, derived by experiments uh, equation for the fluid flow through porous media. From the groundwater, if there is a formation of secondary minerals where, where lithium is included, it gets actually fractionated where the lithium-6, the light lithium, is um, preferentially incorporated into the secondary minerals. Any biological process that incorporates magnesium induces isotope fractionation. The isotopic composition of various parts of plants are different from the nutrient solution or the soil solution they were growing on. The more zinc we produce and the more zinc we use, the more zinc we get released into the environment. The particulates that goes into the atmosphere, that go into the atmosphere, they'll be enriched in the lighter isotope respective to the, you know, the product that remains, that it's purified. There are three different sites of magnesium in clay minerals. It can be in octahedral sites, okay? It can be adsorbed, and it can be in the entire layer. We don't have enough data, so why are we making all these theories? I think we have to be rather cautious of talking of the cell as um, just the black box in which everything is flowing in and out. Do we know that magnesium is goes in and stays there forever, or does it come in and out as the bacteria does whatever it does, you know? These models have actually enormous power to, to help us to, to guide through interpretations because you can start to evaluate fluid flow geometries and, and flow path lengths. That is the aim, and there's actually this for, for like scenario testing. With the new isotope methods, geochemists are only at the beginning in their basic research. But what can their methods be used for? Weathering regulates greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, such as CO2, though very slowly. Isotope ratios reveal how the Earth has regulated its climate over the millions of years of its history, and whether man is throwing the system out of balance today. Metal ores are among the most important industrial raw materials. Using metal isotopes, we want to learn how valuable metals such as copper, zinc or lead have accumulated in the rock in such a way that mining them becomes economic. But today we also want to use these raw materials without damaging the environment. Geochemists have already started using metal isotope compositions from environmental contaminants as clues to their origin. Their fractionation can also help demonstrate how effective environmental remediation efforts are. 
soils must ensure the production of food for a world fast approaching 11 billion people. Metal isotope abundances can be used to track the paths of mineral nutrients from soil to plant and to help develop valuable fertilizers for optimal and economical use. With their basic research today, the scientists aim to make an important contribution to the world of tomorrow.